sovereign hand will be my God. Feet fail, fear surround me. You never trust him because he's faithful and great is his faithfulness. Springtime. 
praise you, God, because you are faithful. You are loving. You are sacrificial. We can never repay the debt we owe. But you loved us. And you called us. And you commissioned us to go and tell that story to others who also can't repay that debt. So help us to be faithful because you are faithful. Amen. In the words of Thomas, the disciple of Christ called Didymus, as we concluded last week, my Lord and my God. After he was confronted with Jesus standing before him, he said, I will not believe until I get to actually put my hand in his side, until I actually can see and touch the wounds that he had. He says, I just, there's no reason why I would believe. And then once he saw it, it, the Bible doesn't say that he touched him. It just says he saw it, and his response was, and it just took that level of faith that he had, and it jumped it probably ten times fold, and he said, my Lord and my God. It was so much more and so much higher than just the fact, oh, wow, you're risen. He recognized that you're not just a man anymore. You are, in fact, God, and you are God Almighty. And so we looked last week at this evidence as we went through the Gospel of John chapter 20. We looked at this evidence of faith, you know, and, and we talked about this reality that we all have degrees of faith kind of coupled with doubt, and we wrestle with our doubt, and we say, wow, I want to have more faith. But we looked at last week, and we saw over and over and over again, we saw it in the Old Testament with God and how he treated Israel. We see it in the New Testament, how Jesus treated his disciples for three years. We're going to see more evidence of it today, but basically how he laid out, watch, guys, watch what I do. Watch what I do, watch what I do. Everything gave them more and more reason, layer upon layer, to increase their faith in him. And yet, even in the midst of that, we saw them, they're struggling with their doubt. And yet God was faithful to continue to show them more and more reasons why, why they could have such faith. He showed himself to them faithful. And so what we're going to do is we're going to come to John chapter 21 here today and I want us to reflect as we get started in John chapter 21, because what we're going to see, and we're going to contrast a few things from this portion of the scriptures, as well as from the earlier part of Jesus' ministry, but I want you to just take a moment and reflect. What has your journey with Jesus been like? For some of us, I want you to reflect on that first moment, way back when for some of you, that first moment when you chose to follow Christ. And for some of us, that's difficult to pinpoint. And I recognize that because reality is our, our journey with Christ is, is just that. It's, it's this journey. But, but even in the midst of that, I think we have these key points. And so reflect that. If you can't think about it, I don't remember that first time where I said yes to Christ. I understand that. But I do believe that there's key points that the Lord has shown to you where he's called you to that next level of faith, kind of like Thomas did last week when he saw and he believed and he said, my Lord, my God. So think back. Take a moment. Just reflect on your journey with Christ. Do you remember the first time you said yes to him? Do you remember a significant moment? Maybe a life-changing moment. It's like, wow, that, my life was different. The Lord met me in this moment. And it changed me. I want you to reflect back to that. Because what we're going to see this morning is this challenge, if you will, to the disciples and then to us. It's almost as reflecting back to, all right, where, what is it, where is it you're at? What is it that you love? You know, I think back when I first, I remember the moment when I first chose to follow Christ. I don't remember my age. I don't remember the date. I know some people do really well with that. I don't, but I remember the circumstances. And it was a guy by the name of L. Fultz. He was leading this VBS. It was at VBS. And I was sitting there near the front row of VBS. We had pews in those days. We didn't have chairs. We were pews. They were very hard. They were, pews were intended to keep you awake because you couldn't find a comfortable spot to sleep. 
So I'm sitting in the pews during this VBS, and I remember, you know, he was the song leader. He kind of did every aspect of the VBS that I remember anyway. And so he was up front, and he basically laid out this message, and he says, if you don't want to go to hell and burn forever, you need to be up here right now. And I was like, I was pretty young at the time. I was like, well, I'm pretty sure that's not really a hard choice to make right now. And so I got up out of my seat, and I went forward, and, and I talked with him, and it was a pretty cool experience because, let's be honest, despite that that message, might, there's, it's a deeper message than what he gave. I'll give you that. But despite what he, he said, it was a real experience. Because I remember going up and having this conversation with him. It's like, wow, that was a life-changing moment. It really was. And so I'm not diminishing that one bit. Yet I see in my life there's been other moments in my journey that I have to look back on and reflect. It's like, wow, God was amazing. I remember, and it took, this was, and I've shared this before. I remember when God called me into ministry. And I was in fifth grade. And the pastor was up there preaching. I said this, you know, he had this great big pulpit. It had shelves underneath it. And so who knows what treasures he can keep into there, you know? And so on occasion, he'd pull up this glass of water. We think it was water. And he would drink, and then he would slide it back. You know, tough congregation, maybe it was. Uh, <laughs> but there was this, you know, I remember sitting there watching him, and I remember having this moment where I really felt God saying to me, you're going to do that for me. And I was just like, really? And so I remember we, we talked about this. I went home and told my parents, like, you know, I, hey, I think God tells me, told me I, I'm going to be a pastor. And their response was, get this. I'm sorry. My parents hate it when I tell this story because they feel like I'm not giving the full picture. But I, I, I said to them, I said, I think God's calling me to, to be a pastor. And they said, oh, you don't want to do that. You don't make enough money. <laughs> okay. Apparently, what I think what they were really trying to communicate was, you need to do something that makes more money so that we can retire early and you can care for us. I think that's what they're really getting at. But there's these, there these moments. I went to a promise keepers then in, in early college. And again, just as life changing. So there's these different moments. They're not new salvation experiences. But I want you to understand that there's these moments that I think God gives to us that cause us to maybe reflect back. It's like, wow, I've not, I don't want to use the word backslid because I don't think that's it. But there's this moment sometimes we get so comfortable with where we've been. Sometimes God uses these moments in our lives to kind of wake us up and look at things maybe with a little bit of a different perspective and to remember that he is who he says he is. That we can remember the love that we once had for him. And that's what I want us to remember this morning as we look through this, because the disciples, I even, I think, they've already seen Jesus risen. We're going to look at them, and I think that they've lost a little bit of what their purpose is. And so we're going to look at that, and it's going to be a lot of fun, because we're going to start way back, way back to when Jesus first calls these guys. So in Luke chapter 5, we're going to use this account. You can find this account uh, similar in the Gospels of Mark as well as Matthew and a little bit in, in the Gospel of John as well. But I want to use Luke because Luke includes a piece in there that I don't want us to miss here this morning. And so we're going to go through this story because this story, what we're going to read, is kind of a foreshadowing and it's a parallel of what we're going to be looking at in John chapter 21 this morning. And it's really kind of fun and exciting. So in Luke chapter 5, verse 1, this is what it says. One day... As Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, that is the same as the Sea of Galilee. All right, that's just a different name. Uh, the Lake of Tiberias, there's, it's the same body of water. And, it, and if you're curious, and this is not a great comparison because I tried to find something, but in reality, the size of the Sea of Galilee in acreage, I'm talking about the, sea, the surface, water surface, is the same as Lake Vermilion. However, Sea of Galilee is one big round body of water, and Lake Vermilion's got all kinds of little branches and things like that. But as far as the size of the lake, it would be quite a bit smaller, like a third of the size of Mille Lacs. Okay? So it's a good-sized body of water, but Lake Mille Lacs would be bigger. It's about 145 feet deep. And I say that because what we're going to see here is a big fishing lake, Okay, like Lake Mille Lacs would be here in Minnesota. It's a big-time fishing lake. But see, it, it makes sense with what's going to be happening in the story. And so the people were crowding around Jesus and listening to the word of God. So here's Jesus, and he's, he's teaching, right? But yet there's such a crowd, not everyone can see him. So watch what he does. He says, so he saw at the water's edge, there's two boats left there by the fishermen who were washing the nets. And so here he is standing on the shore. He's got these fishermen. There's these two boats, and these guys, these fishermen are like washing their nets. It's probably the morning sometime. We don't know how early. They're tending their nets because they, what they would do is they would go out and fish at night. Okay, the best fishing was at night, and they would cast these nets. That's when they would get the most success or have the most success while fishing. 
So there's, two, there's these two boats, and these men, they're washing their nets, and he got into one of the boats, the one that belonged to Simon, and Simon we know is also named Peter. And he asked him to put out a little way from shore. So in other words, he got into the boat, and he slid away from the shore, and then he sat down and taught the people. You know, the, the sitting position for rabbi was normal. When they would teach, they would oftentimes sit. I don't know why you guys make me stand, but I don't mind standing. It's good exercise, right? They say, like, if you're in the office, you should stand up and do your work. Now they have desks and things like that that you can stand at, you know, unless you lock your knees and then you're at a wedding or something, and then they pass out. That would be awkward. <laughs> then, you get, then you get fired for sleeping on the job. All right, but, it, but looking at this here, remember this, we talked about this in the Gospel of John chapter 7. This was an unusual, I'm just re-highlighting that, this is an unusual posture that Jesus took because normally he would sit and he would teach. Well, there was this one moment, you remember this? And he says, on the last and the greatest day of that festival, Jesus stood, okay, he's teaching in a while standing, and he said in a loud voice, let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. And what we're going to see this morning is just this opportunity, this reminder that if you're thirsty, we can go to Jesus and we're going to drink. So we're back to Luke chapter 5. So when he had finished speaking, so Jesus had sat in the boat, we don't know how long it was, but it was probably a relatively long sermon, okay? If we look at and base it off of the Sermon on the Mount, I mean, it took some time. So he's sitting there, and while they're there, so it was morning, we're probably looking, pushing lunchtime here even now, because it was probably several hours there. This is not prime fishing time. And watch what he does. He tells Simon, he says, put out into deep water and let down the net. Simon knows full well, nighttime's the time to fish. We were fishing all night. Watch what he says. Oh, I jumped ahead. Here we go. I'll come back to that. So Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night, and we haven't caught anything, but because you say so... I will let down the nets. In other words, this is an interesting dynamic because here you have this rabbi, he's sitting there teaching. He would have been respected just because he's a teacher of the scriptures. So I think Simon recognizes that and is respecting giving, giving this teacher who he hardly knows yet. He has not yet been fully called, although I think he was. That's what we'll go back to in a second. So here he is teaching and, and then this rabbi who's just got done teaching probably for a couple hours, says to Peter, well, let's head out into some deep water and put down the nets. Okay, here's the thing, Rabbi. Uh, a couple things you need to know. One, we fished all night long and didn't catch anything. Number two, nighttime is the time to fish, not daytime here. However, it's one of those things where, all right, it's probably best to find out for yourself. Okay, so we'll go out, and I'm going to do what it is that you've suggested to do, and we'll just we'll see what, what happens in a sense. But it's an interesting note. This is not the first time that some of these guys have encountered Jesus. And that's where, if we look back, in John chapter 1, do you remember this? So he had John the Baptist had some disciples. They were looking at, at this Jesus. John kept pointing at him said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He says, basically, this guy, I don't even have, I'm not even worthy to tie this guy's sandals. He's so, he is so great. And so some of his disciples see Jesus and they decide to follow him. And when they go to follow him, this is what we find. So turning around, Jesus sees that these guys are following him and he says, what do you want? And they said, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? This happened before this moment at the lake here. And he says to them, come and you will see. And this, many scholars feel like, and look at this, this is, in a sense, a call for these people to come and follow him, even at this time. And yet what we encounter, what we see is, yes, they went and followed him, but they did not yet stay with him. And so maybe there's a higher level of calling that ends up taking place, but the bottom line is I think Jesus called them several times before we see what will actually happen here in Luke. Verse 6, so, so when they had done so, this is when they had gone out to deep water, they'd thrown their nets out into deep water. When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. And so they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help. And they came and filled both boats so, that, so full that they began to sink. Look at the abundance, the excess that Jesus provides. You know, sometimes I think in our lives, we don't really grasp the excess maybe that we have received. But we look at the scriptures. When Jesus gives gifts, he gives them in an abundance. The fish Two boats worth, and both boats are about sinking. That's a lot of fish. I've had some good fishing days. I've had some bad fishing days, but I've never had a day like that. Okay? And so we also see, remember when we looked at when Jesus uh, turns the water into wine, he turns an abundance of the water into wine. And we obviously, we see the, the 
the fish here. When he gives, he gives in abundance. When he broke the bread and fish, remember when he feeds the 5,000? How many basketfuls were left over? 12. He gives in abundance. Let's remember how he gives in abundance because that's what's one of those elements that's going to help us to remember who is this Jesus and who is this Jesus that I first met that first time years ago. Verse 8. So when Simon Peter saw this, I just love this. this is, we've, we've, we've dealt with this passage before. So here you have these two boats. They're being filled with this fish. And I'll look at Simon Peter's response. He, said, he fell at Jesus' knees and he says, Go away from me, Lord. In other words, get away because I am a sinful man. What you have just done, this gift that you have given to me, I am not deserving of this gift. You are, I doubted, even when we said we had fished all night, I, I didn't believe that anything like this would happen. I'm just, I'm awestruck, but even more than just awestruck, something is different about you and I am sinful. And he falls at Jesus' feet and he says, just, I'm not worthy to be here. Get away from me. Cause why? Because you shouldn't be around me? No, it's more like I am a sinful man. I have no business receiving what it is that you've just given me. It's just beautiful. And then for he and all his companions were astonished, and rightly so, at the catch of fish that they had taken. And so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee. Those were Simon's partners in the other boat. And then he says, then Jesus said to Simon, don't be afraid. From now on, you will fish for people. And so they pulled their boats up on shore and they left everything and they followed him. That's a key moment. And so I'm, I'm, I'm convinced that, you know, throughout this, Peter and the other disciples probably had other key moments in their spiritual walks, but this is a key moment because right now they've, they've heard about this Jesus. They've even met him at times. They went and followed him to where he was staying. They've, they've been interacting with him. And here's this moment. They've heard his teaching for a couple hours. They go in, they catch all of these fish, and they come back, and Jesus now says, you guys see what I just did here with all these fish that you just caught? They're great, aren't they? It's like, wow, this is, they were fishermen. That's what they did. And here they have, in other words, all of this income that has just been brought to them. And Jesus says, come and follow me. And it says that they left everything behind. Someone probably took the fish, but it wasn't these guys. You know, someone probably made a killing on the fish, but it wasn't these guys. Instead, they left their nets, they left their boat, they left the fish, and they left. And that's key because we're going to see that come right back around here in a little bit. And so when what ends up happening in the story, we have Peter along with the other disciples, follows Jesus. And in the following of Jesus, he spends three or so years with him. And it's fascinating with what you see with Peter and his following, because he would have watched Jesus heal blind people. And that would have increased his faith. He would have watched Jesus heal the deaf, and that would have increased his faith. He would have watched Jesus know things and tell people things about them that no one else would have known, like Nathaniel. Remember, we talked about it even then last week a little bit, where, where Jesus kind of prophesies, he predicts, he knows exactly what's going on. He knew Thomas didn't believe or he doubted in what it would take for him to believe. Without the disciples telling him what it was, he comes into the room and says, Thomas, look at my hands, look at my side. And you can believe. So he, all of these things kept building into the evidence. He watched Jesus cause a fig tree to wither. He watched Jesus walk on water. And then he invited him also to walk on water. Over and over again, all of this. And so three years worth of this experience builds up this faith to a point where Peter, at the end of this time together, and Jesus is predicting his death, and he says, one of you will betray me. And he even says, Peter, you're the one that will deny me. And Peter's response is never. I have seen you do too many good things. I have seen your power too much. I would never do that. I'm with you. I'm so connected with you. And then we saw the unthinkable. For the third time, he'd already been confronted a couple of times. Peter replied and says, man... I don't know what you're talking about. And he says, just as he was speaking, in other words, just as he had denied Christ that third time, just as he was speaking, the rooster crowed. And I, I, I think 61 and 62 are significant. The Lord turned and looked straight at Peter. They made eye contact. Peter knew exactly what he had said to Jesus before. 
He had known everything for those three years leading up to building up his faith. He makes eye contact with Jesus. And then Peter remembered the word that the Lord had spoken to him. Before the rooster crows today, you will disown me three times. And Peter goes and he weeps bitterly because he recognizes that he failed. He messed up. And he messed up to the person that he cared for very deeply. And it's never going to be the same. And so he goes and he weeps bitterly. And so what we're going to do is we're going to look at this now. With now that we have this understanding of where Peter's been, where Peter's come from, now we look at what we're going to uh, be encountering today with the Gospel of John 21. This story is very similar. It's a, it's a strikingly similar story, and I'm convinced that Jesus is doing this to basically stir in him. Remember, Peter, do you remember that first time when you fell on your face and you said, away from me, for I'm a sinful man? Yep, you were, and you still are. But even in the midst of that, that Luke passage, Peter falls down. He says, away from me, I'm a sinful man. What does Jesus do? He says, come and follow me. I know you're sinful. I get that. I didn't say, go make yourself right and then come follow me. I said, come follow me. And this is just, that's just jaw-dropping crazy. And that's what he does with us. And that's what we get to see even more here today because Peter's forgotten. He doesn't think he's worthy. And he's right. Nothing's changed. And that's what I think bothers, one of the things that bothers Peter so deeply now. And so we look at it, John chapter 21, verse 1. This is where it gets fun. This is where it gets exciting because we're going to see, wow, this just happened again. It happened before. After Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Galilee, it's the same body of water. Okay? I don't know if it's the same beach. It could be because if they were fishing from waters that they knew of before, this could be, in a sense, at that same spot. I don't know that, but it could be. It happened this way. So here's the story. Simon Peter, Thomas, also known as Didymus, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, and the sons of Zebedee and the two other disciples were together. And Peter says, I'm going out and I'm going fishing. Most scholars look at this, and here's what they think. Peter's not saying, I need a distraction. I'm going to go out and go do some fishing, kind of clear my mind. This is basically Peter saying, I don't know what else to do. I messed up. I didn't follow him when I thought I could. He's risen. I don't know what that even means. I'm going back to what I know. I'm going to go back and do what I was doing before this man even came into my life. I'm going back fishing. And the other guys, whether they were like, oh man, maybe Peter's suicidal. Maybe he's going to jump from the boat. Maybe we better go with him. Maybe, it's, maybe that's it. I don't think so, but maybe that's it. That they, what we do see is, we'll go with you. And in a sense, too, Here's this point where they've followed Jesus this whole time. They've hit this climax, okay? Jesus rose from the grave. Now, Jesus isn't around every day like he was before. He appears when he wants to, but don't really, and that's not really working for me, okay? Because sometimes he's there, sometimes he's not. I don't know really what to make of that, but bottom line is, I don't know what to do. And they've kind of forgotten what Jesus had said back in Luke 5. Guys, from now on, I'm going to have you fish for people. And so they leave the people, and they go back and fish for the fish. You see the flip-flop? It's fascinating. So they went out. They got in the boat. But that night, they caught nothing. Oh, that sounds strikingly familiar, doesn't it? Early in the morning, here it is, Jesus on the shore. But the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. Because something, and most scholars believe this too, that, and we see evidence of it. We saw it with Mary. We saw the evidence with even Jesus when he's in the room with his disciples both of those times. Jesus has died and he is raised from the grave and there's something different about his body, okay? We don't know what it is. He's recognizable, but it's a, there's something different about his body. And I think that only makes sense. I hope there's something different about my body when I'm in heaven too, okay? Lots of things, quite frankly, all right? But early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but his disciples did not recognize that it was him. He calls out to them, and I love this. He says, friends, haven't you any fish? A couple of key things here. One is I reflected back to remember back in, I want to say it was John chapter 15, where he says, no longer, says this to his disciples, no longer do I call you servants, but instead I call you friends. Okay. Now, just to be fair, this is a different word than the word that was used in John chapter 15, but what this word means is actually more along the lines of dear children. 
And it's fascinating because you look at this. Here you have Jesus talking to these guys, these partners of his, and he's calling them his children almost at this point. Okay, now I have died and I've raised again. I am God now, and now I'm looking in a sense as my children, as the God the Father would be, can see in a sense through those eyes. And it reminds me of that, that passage that we find in Matthew. I think I have it up here, John, uh, Matthew 23. Yes. Jerusalem, oh Jerusalem. Remember Jesus is standing on the, on the mountain side. He's looking down at Jerusalem. He says, oh, Jerusalem, how I have longed. Okay, you kill the prophets of stone, of the prophets and stone those who I sent to you. How often have I longed to gather your children together as hens gathers her chicks under her wings, and yet you are not willing. And so here I see Jesus standing on, on the, the shores and saying, Friends, my dear children, those who I have gathered, don't you have any fish? And that's a negative question. He's not saying, do you have any fish? He's, he knows already. This is that prophecy. But haven't you any fish? He's away from the shore. How would he even know? But yet he knows. And these, these guys are looking at him. It's like, well, well, that's kind of a pessimistic guy, you know? How would he know that we don't have any fish? And their answer is, no. No, we don't. And then Jesus says this. Throw your nets on the right side of the boat, and you will find some. It's not, this is, the language here is not like, hey, I got a good spot you should try. I've had some success here in the past. Head over here, right off of that point. The water just starts to get a little bit deeper right there. That's where you want to fish. Try it there. I've had some success there. That's not what he's saying. He's saying basically stay where you're at, throw your nets on the right side of the boat, and you will catch some. There's no try involved in here. It's like Yoda, okay? No try, just do. So when they did, they were unable to haul in the net because of the large number of fish. That sounds similar. I think I've heard that before, haven't you? What's interesting is so much, they didn't have two boats to kind of divide it up in this time, and so this time they're actually going to drag the net off the side of the boat back to shore because they cannot get the net into the boat. Verse 7 says this, Then the disciple whom Jesus loved, this is John, said to Peter, they're, they're in the boat, and John recognizes like this is not just someone, that's the Lord. They've seen him before. This is the third time. We'll see that evidence here too. It's the Lord. Peter, hearing this, I am convinced that Peter must have known, must have remembered at this moment, that last time that this happened, when he fell face first in front of Jesus and said, away from me, for I'm a sinful man. And Jesus just did it again. And here's Peter, and I'll look at his response. He's done this once before too. He jumped out of the boat, Okay. He must be impulsive a little bit. So he jumps outside of the boat. It does say that he put, wrapped his outer garment around him. This is very interesting because normally if you're going to get into the water, you would take the outer garment off. It's actually believed, just to not get too graphic, it's believed that Peter was probably fishing naked. Okay? And so out of respect to going to greet someone, you'd have to have the outer garment on. I know, this is awkward. This really turned awkward in a hurry, didn't it? But the other aspect of it is when you, when you come out of, the, they're only 100 yards from shore, and so it wasn't very deep water. They didn't have as far to go. They were much deeper last time. Anyway, so he says, it is the Lord. He wraps his outer garment around him, for he had taken it off, and he jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat. This is where they're towing the net, and the net is full of fish. For they were not far from shore, only about 100 yards. When they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals. I, just a bit of ir irony. We'll talk about this in a couple of weeks. A bit of irony. It was over a fire, a charcoal fire, that Peter denied Christ three times. And now, just a bit of irony, it's over a charcoal fire that we'll see in a couple of weeks how Jesus will restore Peter as well. It's just beautiful. So here they get, okay, when they landed, they saw a fire burning, uh, of burning coals there with fish on it and some bread. And so here's Jesus is already cooking. All right, they didn't bring the fish up yet because we see, so as Jesus says, bring some of the fish that you've caught. We're going to add to it. Again, there's just, just an abundance. And he says, Simon Peter climbed back into the boat and dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, 153. But even with so many, the net was not torn, which is another miraculous thing that Jesus made sure took place. And Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. Come and fellowship with me. Come and be with me. And that's significant to what we're going to wrap up here in a moment this morning. None of the disciples dared to ask, who are you? Because they knew it was the Lord. And Jesus came, he took the bread and he gave it to them and did the same with the fish. And this was now the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. And here's what I want to wrap up. I mean, it's a great story. It's a wonderful story. And you see the, the parallels between the two. 
But you see the disciples that came to this moment, they'd, they'd encountered everything. They'd been with Jesus on all of those amazing and miraculous events. They've seen Jesus raised from the dead, and yet here they are finding themselves like, I don't know what to do. And so they go back to what they were called away from, and they start doing that which they only know. And it kind of leaves me wondering, I, I think they lost two things. I think they lost their purpose, and they lost the remembering of their first love. You know, I think they still love Jesus. Don't misunderstand me. I think they still love him deeply. But something, they forgot what Jesus had called them to do. And so there's a purpose. So what, and you got to reflect on what is our purpose. And I'm not going to go into any Rick Warren stuff, the purpose-driven life stuff. And I understand there's some, some value to that. But I think a purpose is a little bit simpler than that. And we see it in the scriptures throughout. I think of, of one passage where we talked about it before. You have two women. You have Mary and you have Martha. And Jesus goes to visit them. And here's Martha busying herself, getting everything ready. And then she ends up getting upset with Jesus and saying, Jesus, will you not tell my sister, because she's mostly upset with her, saying, tell my sister to help me do some stuff here. I'm serving you by myself. And Jesus gently says, oh, Martha, you're missing it. Don't you see that Mary has chosen the better thing? She's chosen to be with me. And when we look at purpose, what is our purpose as people? Why has God created us? I'm convinced that God has created us to be with him, just to simply be with him. You see it in the life of Christ. How often did Jesus Christ go away from all of the busyness to a secluded place just to be with God? He removed himself and he prayed just to be in the presence of God. I think that's one element we miss a lot. Now, one of the things that we do tend to do, and we'll come back to it, we, we tend to look at, the, we have, often we have beers and we have doers, and we oftentimes don't mix the two well. Let's just be honest, because sometimes I just want to be, and I want to be there forever. I get that. That sounds nice, right? But then we also have, like, well, I don't have time to be. All I have time to do is do. And so I'm a doer for life, and I'm doing all this stuff for God. I'm do, 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 do. All right? I just said do, do. Uh, <laughs> So you have both elements there, but I think the reality of it is we're called to both. Because not only are we supposed to be, then we look at what Peter did when he was in that boat that first time. He recognized who he was. I am so not worthy. He fell on his face and said, away from me, away from me, because I am a sinful man. He worshiped God in that moment. And I'm convinced here, his jumping out of the boat is an act of worship. He wants to be with the Lord. It's like, you are good. You are great. You know, we look at worship sometimes as, as so much involved in music. And I think music is excellent when it comes to worship. But worship is so much more than music. Worship is recognizing you are good. And just, I mean, I, I can walk around and just say, oh, you're so good. I'm, I'm worshiping. There's no, there's no music. I'm not singing. If I was singing, everyone else would not be worshiping. And so there's this element that we're created not only to be with him, but we're also created to worship him. And then the other aspect is we're also then created, there's a do element. We are created to do what it is that he's asked us to do. And he had asked the disciples to come and fish for men and not fish for fish anymore. That doesn't make the fishing bad. But they're forgot, they have forgotten what it was that they were called to in the first place. And so we are called to do some things. We're called to follow him. We're called to do what it is that he's asked to do. We're called to be, we're called to worship, and we are called to do. And it fits so perfectly with what we believe here in our core values. We're called to worship. We're called to be with him. We're called to connect with him. And we are called to serve him. I want to wrap it up with this. And I found this in John, the same author as, as what we have just gone through in the gospel of, uh, of, of John chapter 21. Same author. He gets this vision from God, and he writes it down. And this is what Jesus tells John to write down. And he says, to the angel of the church in Ephesus, which is a great church. Paul planted the church. It was a healthy church. They do a lot of good things. But look at what he says. Jesus says to John to write this down. Write these words down. He says, these are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. In other words, this is God telling you. He says, I know your deeds. I know your hard work. 
I know your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people and that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not and have found them false. These are all good things. He is not criticizing them for any one of those things. But this is what he says. You have persevered and have endured hardships for my name and have not grown weary, all good, yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love that you had at first. You have forgotten. You've gone back to what it is that you knew before. Like the disciples went back to fishing because that's what they knew before and they forgot what it was that I was calling them to do, which was to be with me, which was to worship me, and which was to follow me. So consider how far you have fallen. Repent and do the things that you did at first. I'm going to invite Lane and the worship team up. And let's worship. And let this be a time, you know, we can be with with the Lord. We can be with him alone, which oftentimes I think is valuable. We need to have times like that. But we can also be with him corporately, which is what we have to experience here. And we can worship him corporately and we can serve him corporately and we can serve him privately and all of those things I think need to take place. But we're going to do worship corporately right now and we're going to be with him corporately right now. And I'll give a word of benediction at the end, but let's worship together. Let's stand and sing. God, you don't need me, but somehow you want me. intentions all my obsessions I want to lay them all down in your hands only your love is vital I'm not entitled still you call me your child Somehow you want me, oh how you love me Somehow that frees me to take my hands off of my life And the way it should go I've had plans Shattered and broken Things I have spoken Fall through my hands You have plans To redeem and restore me You're behind me
to you. May you remember the first time, maybe. Remember the love that you had for him. To remember that first love. And if you've never made that choice, today's a good day to make that choice. Well, oh, it's just crazy. You look at Peter and he, he turned back, still feeling unworthy. He messed up. Yep. But yet, God wanted him. He wanted to be with him. That's just beautiful. He wants to be with you. He wants your worship. It's good. Let me pray. Father, I give you thanks that you want us. I do pray that your spirit will lead us to remember that which we have been called to, a calling to be with you, a calling to worship you and a calling to follow you. Thank you for wanting us. In Jesus' name, amen.